Hey guys, welcome back to another video. So, sorry about uh, the white walls. I am at Stewart's Point. We are leaving this afternoon. Hopefully we'll be back in time before the Super Bowl starts because I'm very excited for the Super Bowl to kick off um, for the trailers. So, but today I am counting down my top 10 most underrated comic book movies. Because I think that there's a lot of comic book movies that people kind of miss the point of them. And I'm going to give you some of the reasons why I love them and why I think that they're underrated. The first one up is The Amazing Spider-Man 2. I love The Amazing Spider-Man 2 even more than the first one. Because the reason why I didn't really like the first one so much was because it kind of fit to... It tried to be The Dark Knight, right? And... I think that when you're trying to be the Dark Knight in a Spider-Man movie, that kind of turns me off because Batman is my favorite DC superhero, but I love Spider-Man for the completely different reason than Batman, right? I like Spider-Man because he's funny, he's goofy, and I think that the um, Spider-Man quips in that movie, well, most of them anyway, aren't really that great. I think that they're kind of cringe. Like the whole, um, like the whole knives bit where it's like, oh my god, small knives! I think that that's really, really cringe. But I think that The Amazing Spider-Man 2 nails the clips more. Like, the swing clips when he's gone, what, what you got for me today, New York? And also the bit where he's trying to talk to Rhino and he's like, hey there, I'm Spider-Man, you can call me Webhead, you can call me Amazing, just don't call me late for dinner, you get it? I think that, that is really, really cool uh, for a Spider-Man clip. I think that that is some of the best Spider-Man clips we've gotten. And I am a big Tony McGuire Spider-Man fan, right? I think that his clips are very, very good. But Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man, even if you don't like his movies, you've got to agree that the clips are really well done. Now, I think The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is also really good because it reminded me why I love Spider-Man because it kind of gets back to the roots of the Sam Raimi trilogy, like the uh, kind of goofiness and also the light hardness of that, of, um, of that series. And also we get introduced to a, in my opinion, an amazing villain in Jamie Foxx's Electro. And then we get a really creepy update of the Green Goblin, which I think that is what the Green Goblin should, should do. Because... Even though I love Willem Dafoe's version of the Goblin in both the original Spider-Man and even No Way Home, I think the Dane DeHaan's Goblin is one that creeps me out. I think that that's something that the Goblin should do to viewers of Spider-Man movies, right? And I think that The Amazing Spider-Man 2 captures that essence of that creepiness of the Goblin. And whatever you say about Paul Giamatti, like, I think that the last, uh, like, the en actual ending, uh, like, Battle of Spy vs. the Rhino is a really cool fight, because you see the whole thing of him swinging the manhole cover, I think that that's really, really cool, and also, I think the score in this movie is really, really cool, because you, like, Hans Zimmer gets Spider-Man, it feels like this big, grandiose movie, which I think is really, really cool, I like how... Hans Zimmer made basically like in ways better than the original Sam Raimi theme, but the Danny Elfman Sam Raimi theme is the best, and then it's this, and then it's the home the Tom Holland Spider-Man theme, and then the Amazing Spider-Man first theme. Even though that I do love the Amazing Spider-Man first theme, I think that this one nails it. So. That's why I personally really love The Amazing Spider-Man 2, and I think that it's one of those movies that will become more, uh, like, people will start to appreciate more as it goes, as life goes along, and I think that's one of the things where it's like, people are starting to love Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man after No Way Home, so I think that this movie really nails Spider-Man in the amazing universe. So number nine for me is Suicide Squad 2016. Now, I have always stood up for this movie ever since 2016 when it came out, and I think that 
you get a lot of really great performances in that movie. You get Margot Robbie. I think that she's a perfect Harley Quinn. I'm curious to see what Lady Gaga does, but to me, Margot Robbie is Harley Quinn. No one can touch her. And of course, Will Smith is Deadshot. I think that that's such a great character, and I'm so mad that he didn't come back for the Suicide Squad, the James Gunn one. Even because I love his character. I think that he such, has such a great story. And I think that it's one of those things where it's like... Will Smith hasn't done a lot of superhero things. Same as Margot Robbie. They've only really done this movie, I think. Even when you look at Gerald L.S. Joker, right? I think that that's really, really cool. I think that that's a cool take on the Joker. Which, like... And the theory that came out around 2016 when this movie came out, I think it was an interesting theory that Jason Todd was actually this Joker and then there was the real Joker somewhere out there. I think that was kind of interesting. But I think that that was a real cool kind of theory. And I think that the things with that too is that like you also get some really great scenes in that movie. You get... Like, Ben Affleck's Batman going up against Deadshot. I think that, that is probably one of my favorite scenes in the DCEU. Is just that scene. And even one of my favorite chases in or Batmobile scenes in the DCEU is the Batmobile um, chasing Joker and Harley Quinn in that beautiful car chase. And you get to see Batman doing his scene, trying to take down... Harley Quinn and Joker, and then they land in the water, and Batman flies in. I think that that is such a cool scene, and I think that the whole thing of, like, I think that all these actors do a great job. I think that there are some things that don't make any sense. So on the first one, basically, they do the rule of if anything kill, if anything happens to Rick Flag, you're all dead. But what happens in the second one? They... Something happens to Rick Flag. He dies. And nothing happens to them. None of them die. Which... Part of me is relief, but it's the other thing where it's like, you've set up this rule of like, if... If Rick Flag dies, they all die as well. And you didn't follow up on that. So that's why I think that this one is more consistent and better than the 2021 version. Because even though that James Gunn might do a better job at Gore than David Ayer, I think that the if we eventually get the air cut, I think it will be one of the best superhero movies of all time. Much like the Zack Snyder Justice League. So that's why I really like Source Squad 2016. Now, number eight for me is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. Now, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 to me is one of those movies that it broke the mold for what the rut that we were in. The first one, the turtles go to fight the foot and shredder. The second one, they foot, they fight the foot soldiers, the foot coin and the shredder, and Tokan Raza. So, if we had Stay in New York. Yeah, we probably could have done a different film, but I liked how it was like going back in time, and it, and it was something that kids could watch that were interested in, in uh, Japan, and that movie kind of was able to make kids learn about Fuel Japan in the Ninja Turtles movie, so I think that that was really, really cool, and I think that the some of the quotes are really quotable, like they're really bad lines, but they're very really funny and quotable. Like, who are you expecting? Maybe you're the Ems family? And I think that the performances are really good in this movie. And also, everyone in this movie tried to make a best, the best movie as they can. They probably knew that it wasn't going to be as good as the first one, but they probably knew that they could make a really good movie that could follow up Secret of the Use. So I think it's one of those things where it's like people might grow to like the third one because you because people would really like to have the turtles going back in time. So I think that that is a really, really cool thing for 
Ninja Turtle fans and also people that need to learn about Feudal Japan and going back in time. So number seven for me is Superman Returns. Now Superman Returns is my second favorite Superman movie right under Superman 2. Uh, so Superman Returns is a great way to do a soft reboot and also it's a way to do a soft reboot that isn't that is good because normally when you get soft reboots like we'll get to another kind of soft reboot that's in the same kind of world as the first one further on my list but Superman Returns you get one of my favorite Supermans ever in Brendan Ralph you get one of the most underrated Lois Lanes in Kate Bosworth you also get one of the best Lex, Lu Lex Luthor's in Kevin Spacey you also get James Marsden in this movie. I'm a big James Marsden fan. I was a big fan of Hop growing up. And I really love the X-Men movies. And I really like the Sonic movies. So, the fact that you get James Marsden on Superman Returns is really, really cool to me. And the storyline of Superman basically going off and going off for years and basically that... His kid is basically Lewis Lane's son. Is really, really cool to me. And I think that's such a sweet story. And the fact, even though that is a little creepy that he's stalking it, uh, that he's, like, um, watching over his son um, while he's sleeping, very much like um, Edward and Bella in Twilight, it's that I should be going, like, Oh, why are you doing that, dude? But really, I'm kind of like, no, this is actually a sweet moment. Because then, you get the little kid saying, bye to Superman, and then Kate Boswell turns around, you see Superman there for the first time. Well, not for the first time, but since the death. Um, and then, you get the classic Christopher Reeve, like, pretty much a longer version of it, but a the classic Christopher Reeve, like two men flying with the classic Christopher Reeve theme playing in the background. I think that that's such a really, really cool thing that they did for this movie because the Christopher Reeve Superman theme is in my top five favorite uh, movie themes or even superhero themes in general. Like, I think it's so good. And even though I'm not a big Superman person, that theme is like, that's Superman. Like, and the fact that they did basically an homage film to the Christopher Reeve eras, but with the modern technology and new suit. It's really, really cool, and I think it ties in to the Superman, especially Superman 1 and the Donner Cut of 2 really, really well. So I think that that really, really helps Superman Returns. So... That's why I really like Superman Returns. I think it's one of the more underrated Superman films that we have. So number six for me is Spider-Man 3. Spider-Man 3, this movie has gotten more, um, like, acceptance over time, um, which I love. I think it's very, very good, but there's still some people that don't like it. The only stuff that... Even though that I do like it, the only stuff that kind of makes me go like, this could be a different movie, is the Venom stuff. I think that the stuff with Eddie Brock, the stuff with Harry, if you didn't have Venom, you could probably expand that out more. Uh, uh, like, not with the PTSD stuff. But, for the most part, the stuff with Harry, the stuff with Sam Man, the stuff with Eddie Brock, before he comes Venom, and the relationship problems, and I even done my Gwen Stacy in that movie, are really, really good. There's a lot of strong things in Spider-Man 3 that people just look past because they're like, oh, Spider-Man 3 is not really that good. But I think that there's so many great things in Spider-Man 3 that, more pe that people give credit for because I think it's one of those things where it's like you have Spider-Man trying to deal with the... trying to deal with the black suit and where it comes from and how he treats his loved ones by having the black suit. And you see that really well in like the, um, like in that club scene 
after the whole dancing thing, but the whole bit where he pushes down Mary Jane and stuff like that, that, if the whole movie was just that and not the dance stuff, I think that would be really, really cool. But I do get why they want Peter Parker, Tobey Maguire's version of Peter Parker is doing dancing up and down the street because that Peter Parker would make himself look cool by doing that. That actually really, really works. Because you do see, um, like, you do see Tony Maguire, his version of Peter Parker anyway, as that kind of door. So I think if, which if you try it with Andrew Garfield, he would have been that, like, whole, like, that, that type of guy, like, um, like in the social network where he slams the laptop down and stuff like that. I think that is what you would get out of Andrew Garfield. And even the cutscene from Amazing Spider-Man 2 where he beats up Green Goblin. That's what you were going out of Andrew Garfield Spider-Man. I don't know what you were going out of Tom Holland because we didn't we haven't seen that kind of um even though that we did get his at the end of that in No Way Home. Um I don't know what they would do. I think that the, I won't be surprised if they did more of the Andrew Garfield route. Uh where he's just like beating up criminals and stuff. But I see Stuff like Andrew Garfield and Tom Holland going more down that mean route, which Tom McGuire's version would go way more into the goofy route. But that's why I really like Spider-Man 3. I think that it's one of those films that people have accepted over time, which is really, really cool to see. Now, no number five for me is a bit of a tie. Because it's one of my favorite Jim Carrey movies, and the other one is one that's not a good movie, but... I look to it as more of a modern version of um, an early adaptation of this character. And that is Batman Forever, directed by Joel Schumacher, the late Joel Schumacher, and Batman Robin, also by Joel Schumacher. So, I think that Batman Forever, we'll start with, with Batman Forever. I like Batman Forever. I think Val Kilmer is a great Batman. I love Jim Carrey's Riddler. He's my favourite Riddler ever. Um, I think that it's one of the things where it's like you have stuff like, like, when you have that and you have the whole story about Robin and doing the stuff with uh, Batman's PTSD and um, Riddler trying to find things for this, his brain box, I think that that is a really, really cool story for a Batman movie. I think that it's one of those things where it's like, it's something that you could only get out of the Joel Schumacher Batman movies. Which if you try to do something like that in like the Dark Knight or the Affleck Batman or the Keaton Batman or the Rob Pattinson Batman, it wouldn't work. That's why the Rob Pattinson Batman did more of a Zodiac Killer type of Riddler. So I think that's one of those things where it's like you can do the PTSD in any of these Batman movies because that's a really dark story and it's a really good story for a Batman movie, but the fact that this, that Batman Forever was able to jumble um, the whole thing of the storyline with the with Riddler and Two-Face and Robin and Chase and Batman was really, really impressive. I think that, that I think that Joel Schumacher and the studio did a great job with Batman Forever. But Batman for Rob, Batman Robin to me, I always took it as a modern version of the Adam West series. So, the Animal series is goofy and it's fun. That's what Batman and Robin is to me. With, um, it's, I also view it as a comedy. So, if you view it as a comedy, you would go more like, oh, I'm laughing at it, as opposed to I'm laughing with it. Because if you're laughing, if you're going, like, if you're watching it as a true Batman movie, like, especially when you have things like the, the Bird and Batmans and even Forever and, um, the Nolan verse and the Snyder verse and the Matt the Reeves verse, you you'd be like this movie is awful, but when you look at it as like this is a very funny Batman comedy like parody film, it actually really really works surprisingly, and I think that George Clooney is one of the more unappreciated Batmans we've gotten, and I think that Alicia Silverstone was actually pretty good as Batgirl. Like, you could have improved 
um, Poison Ivy, but I think that Arnold Schwarzenegger, he does a great performance. I think that that is a great performance in a really, really bad movie. I think that that really, really works in this movie. I think that if you kind of not took, if you took the, uh, oh my god, what's it called? The neon lights out of um, the Batcave and the and Gotham Sea, I think that that would work really, really well. So I think that would work um, if you did that. But that's why I have Batman Forever and Batman and Robin um, there, because I think that's one of those movies that I'm just like, I get why people don't like it, but just why. But number four for me is X-Men 3 The Last Stand. I think X-Men 3 has some really, really great emotional stuff. I think that the stuff that we get with, like, Scott dying off, sc off screen, I get why people might find a problem with that. But to be fair, I can't get why the studios would be pissed off because he was going to do X-Men 3, but then they had to kill him off because he was doing Superman Returns. So, I get why they did that. But the stuff with Jean Grey is really emotional. I felt, I felt it when she was torn Professor X to shreds and... Um, I felt the emotion that Magneto and Wolverine and Storm had in that scene where they're like, No, Charles! I think that that is such an emotional scene and I think that the whole scene where you get pretty much this Avengers Endgame kind of battle where you have the X-Men facing off Magneto's brotherhood and Jean Grey and Jean Grey is like the Thanos figure. Like, you have like Magneto, like even Magneto and um... The Brotherhood are more like the the minions, like that's just minions. But Jean Grey is the last one standing, and Wolverine has to deal with it. And the fact that even though that they didn't, they wanted to kind of keep X Men Three attached to the Brian Singer movies, and also kind of detach it from those movies with Days of Future Past. When even though that if they were going keep those scenes, it's weird that they had um, Gene and like Franklin Jensen and James Marsden appear at that last shot um, of Days of Future Past, but that whole scene where um, James McAvoy's uh, Charles like touches Wolverine's brain and you see all this stuff go through from like the stuff with Gene from the first movie to the second movie to the third movie, that is emotional stuff. So I think that Days of Future Past made X-Men 3 a lot better than what X-Men 3 already is. Because X-Men 3 to me is a great movie. And I think it's one of those movies that's like, it's action packed, it has a lot of drama. It doesn't really have much comedy, but it's a drama film. Like, all those X-Men movies were drama movies. And like, the second one was about Wolverine dealing with his past. And the first one was about um, like, them trying to persuade Wolverine to join their team. But this one deals with more drama than even the second one does. I don't get why people don't like it. But that's why I think X-Men 3 is more one of the more unappreciated uh, X-Men movies ever. Okay, so number three for me is Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice. I get that it's messy. I think that Ben Affleck did a great job as Batman and I think that he's one of my favorite Batmans of all time. And also I think that the a lot of the fight scenes are really good because Zack Snyder knows how to direct a fight scene. If you look at his other DC movies like Man of Steel or um, Zack or his version of Justice League or 300 or stuff like that, he knows how to direct action. So you get his interpretation of these gods of like of all these gods basically just dealing how much Superman has destroyed people and killed people in Man of Steel and even people that don't like Man of Steel this movie should make you go like you know what there's actually a story here that they are trying to pick up from Man of Steel because you even see the beginning where Batman or Bruce Wayne actually is running through the buildings and saving people. That is such a scene of like, oh my god. And then, like, even getting the introduction to Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. She is really, really awesome in that movie. And I think that it's one of those things where it's like, the, like, 
the Amy Adams stuff is a bit like I'm torn because I really like her as Lois Lane, but they're always trying to find her something to do when it comes to the battles. But I think that it's one of the more unappreciated movies. And I think that's one of those things where it's like you get one of those movies that is like, what, like, what are we going to do with this character? What are we going to do with this character? We need something for this character to do other than just stand around doing nothing the whole time. So I think that that is one of the more interesting things about this movie is that like, you're dealing with the whole thing with Superman, you're having Batman having his dreams. There are too much stuff going on, but I think that it does handle it really well, especially in the, in the Ultimate Edition. Number two for me is Thor Love and Thunder. Now, everyone loves Thor Ragnarok, but if you're sick of the title, Taika Waititi chick, you shouldn't have seen this movie then. Because, like, everyone watches the tra those trailers, and they... Everyone loves them. And I think that's one of those things where it's like... This movie is emotional. You get the whole... Like, you get a lot of serious stuff in this movie. If you think that this movie is just by joke after joke after joke... There are jokes... There are a lot of jokes in this movie, but when... When it's serious time, Thor gets serious, Jane gets serious, Gore gets serious. Like, that whole bit where they're on Gore's planet, that's a very intense scene where he has them all tied up and he's talking to them. That's a really intense scene. And even the whole thing of Jane dealing with um, her cancer and how Mionia hurt, how Jane... When she uses Mionia, that kind of puts more of the cancer and makes her die quicker. So, that movie to me is a like, whoa. So, it's one of those things where it's like, you have that, but then you also have like, the whole, like, like, even Korg. Korg, I can see why people wouldn't like, like, don't find his jokes that funny in this movie, but, hear me out. The fact that you get his story time in the beginning, and you get his voice over, over the Thor and Jane montage, and you get his voice over that bookends the film with Love and Thunder, that to me, basically means that this is Korg's version of the story. It's like, this is how Korg would have told it, but that's not the actual version that we got that we got to see. And that feels like a Tucker Wati thing to me. I think that that is such a great thing that they did in Love and Thunder, is that they try to make it more kind of serious, and it's like one of those things where it's like, if you have that mindset of like, this is Goofy and this is Korg's version of the story, and that there are serious moments, that movie would have done a lot better and people would have appreciated it more. Right? Because I've heard that the... Because apparently the critics love it. The audiences don't. I think that... And every time I hear, Oh, Buddy Thor one Bunda sucks or something like that, it just makes me go like, You don't get the point. But that's why I have Thor, Love and Thunder as number two. Because I think Thor, Love and Thunder is one of the more un unappreciated Marvel films ever made. Now, num number one for me is a tie again of the Michael Bay Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies. Now, the first one, I think it's a really, really good movie. I think it's serious. I think it's what they try to do with the, um, with the Eastman Lair comics. And they even throw a bit of Dark Knight is in there, which the Dark Knight stuff to me works with the Turtles because they've had those, those type of darker stories, which unlike The Amazing Spider-Man, that doesn't work for me, even though that because there are actually a lot of jokes in Team and T twenty fourteen, but there have been a lot of dark stories of the Tales in the past. So 2014 Tales works for me, and I think it's one of those things where it's like you get the incredible fight scenes, like the snow chase scene, like it's incredible. It does go on for a while, but the more longer it goes for, the more you're like, yes, this is actually good fight scene. And then you actually get the fight scene in the sewers, which I think is really, really cool. And even though that you don't get much of the subway fight scene, I think it's really, really cool. 
the fact that they're running through and the trench gone past and you see Raph and he's like gone through the shadows very very quickly and the final battle is a bit more like the first movie where they're fighting Shredder. The reason why they find the Shredder is for a different purpose than the original movie and that's why I like it is that it is a reboot but it's not like um, it's not like oh let's go and stop Shredder cause with like in the original movie um, this one is actually like he's gonna spray gas all over the sea we need to stop him now so and also 20 I mean out of the shadows Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows is a great version or live action version of storylines from Secret of the Use and also trying to add, like make a movie adaptation of the classic cartoon series because we finally get to see Bebop and Roxy on the big screen. We finally got to see Krang on the big screen. We saw different designs of the turtles trying to make them less creepy. And this is what I try to try to say with Superman Returns. They try to soft reboot it. Even though they're in the same universe, they try and change a lot of the backgrounds, a lot of the designs, a lot of the stuff that happens in the previous movie. They, they try to recast some of the films like Shredder and Backstar and Karai. All that stuff they recast, which I think that is, was actually kind of a brilliant job. So, and I really liked how the fight scenes are because, like, when you watch. The Bebop and Roxy plane fight scene, you're like, oh my god, I'm seeing the Ninja Turtles fight Bebop and Roxy on the big screen. This is amazing. But then when you see, um, like the Krang fight scene, you're like, oh my god, this is exactly like a cartoon, but in live action, like Krang fighting the turtles off is really, really cool to see. And even the, uh, Shredder Escape one, where Shredder is locked up and the Tolls are trying to keep him in the truck when they try not to make sure to escape. That scene's also really cool and even the Cassie Jones fight scene where he's going up against all the foot soldiers, that's really cool. And I really like every I like everyone in these movies. Will and is hilarious. Megan Fox is hot as frick. Stephen Amell is a great Cassie Jones. Not as good as Elias Cardius, but I still really like Stephen Amell. I think that he's one of the more appreciated Casey Jones that we've had. I love the Turtles in the second one. I also love them in the first one, but I think that they get more the chemistry in the second one that lands for me. Um, like, I do have... I will make a video essay of the Ninja Turtles movies. I think that these Ninja Turtles movies nail it. I think it's a great... They're great movies. I think that... They're the underrated, most underrated comic book movies ever made. So guys, please hit the like button down below if you haven't already. Hit subscribe, also hit the little bell icon to get notified future videos I make. And I'll see you guys next time. Take care. Bye. Hey there. Subscribe to my channel. And also press this bell icon.